gathered in their masses Just like witches at black masses Evil minds at plot destruction Sorcerer of death's construction In the fields of bodies burning As the war machine keeps turning Death and hatred to mankind Poisoning their brainwashed minds Oh, Lord, yeah. Thank you for coming out to celebrate the life of my father, uh, Stan Schorsch. Um, thank you to, to my friends who have, who have been helpful to me uh, over the last few days and for coming out. It's good to see some of you that I haven't seen in years, uh, friends and family, and I'm meeting some new people uh, for the first time uh, today as well. It's, it's, I, I appreciate your, your love and support. I thought I'd, I'd run through the plan for uh, today's service. It's going to be a little bit unconventional, probably, but I think that's fitting because my father was a fairly unconventional man. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. So uh, we're going to have a few uh, members of the family who have a few words to say. And then I thought we would open it up to uh, anybody else who might have a, a story to tell or, a, or some thoughts to share. I'm sure those would be appreciated. And then I will close, uh, and then we'll have a, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, an, an outro. What's the opposite of an intro? We'll have an, we'll have an outro of my dad's favorite song. Uh, and then I would invite all of you to, uh, to come to a uh, lunch with us at the at the Golden Corral, we've got a um, we've got a, a a private room there, and you can just flash your flash your program, and they'll let you right in. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something my dad would have approved of. <laughs> uh, Lori, would you like to begin? man. It was on my birthday of 87, not 69, that we met. Carl and Marlee set us up on a blind date. Turned out we already knew each other and things moved forward after that. Stan was a hotshot pool player in town and always at ladies night at, as Barb and I at Garfield's every Wednesday night. He would always smoke us up. Speaking of pool, he was the most competitive player in town. He broke many a pool cue. He had first place trophies, number one player in town in his day. 30 years of fun and tears, mostly love. 
I loved him, I was pissed off at him, but mostly loved him. <laughs> he took me all over the world. The most, the month-long trip crossing the equator to Tahiti and Society Islands was our favorite. <coughs> I'd like to be a permanent passenger on a cruise ship, and I think Stan would agree. The time he scared me most was in Guatemala. Neither of us spoke but a few words of Spanish. We should have taken lessons from his son, Rick. <laughs> Long story short, we took an excursion on a bus 30 miles from where we were staying. Stan was very good at directions, except for in Guatemala. <laughs> we got lost, and by the grace of God, we found our bus to take us back to where we were staying. We had many adventures. We bought a cabin at Sheep Creek, past salmon. Only problem was, the creek and the outhouse didn't constitute running water and a bathroom. We had a huge addition added, including a bathroom, a well, a laundry room, an extra bedroom. We took annual trips to Alaska for king salmon fishing. Stan catching a trophy king salmon over 50 pounds and a hog halibut weighing over 500 pounds. Both were mounted along with his moose, all proudly displayed at the cabin. When we went to Alaska, we'd stay with Gina and his tall son, Izzy. We had great fun playing cards for hours, hand and foot. I even learned how to play Texas Hold'em. Stan and Izzy were adventurous or idiots. I'd say the latter. And went grizzly hunting with paintball guns. The dumb things they did. This being one of the dumbest. We also took trips to Florida, and thanks to Pam, we were comped many wonderful trips to Disney theme parks. We saw Eddie Money there twice. Thank you, Pam and Charlie, for your most gracious hospitality. You treated us like royalty. I can't thank you enough for your fine gourmet meals, great company, and awesome generosity. Pam, you are the hostess with the most of I'll never forget your hospitality. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Stan was a grumpy bear sometimes, but he was my hairy bear, a big teddy bear at heart, and will be missed dearly. I hope to see him again on the other side. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. It means the world to me. God bless you, and I love you all. Thank you again. I'd also like to say the Lord's Prayer if, if you all will join with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think I've met most everybody here now, and if I haven't got to meet you yet, please talk to me afterwards. I'm uh, Pam, Stan's sister. And what more can I say except that Stan was the best brother in the world, you know? And I'm so grateful that our last words to each other uh, over the phone were just a very meaningful, I love you. And it was just as one of those sincere, moments, not a love you, it was a real, I really do love you moment. So, um, as you all know, Stan was the kind of guy who could, would give the shirt off his back to help somebody. He uh, could never say no. He was generous to a fault, as my husband says. <laughs> Very kind and giving and tenacious, and that's our Stan. However, things weren't always that rosy with his big sister. We'd have our fights and squabble, as siblings do, and I'm still terrorized by the memories of him chasing me around the block on 4th Street with a live snake. Some of you may have remembered that. And then there was a time he put crawdads in my bathtub. <laughs> and at 16, I thought I was pretty popular, and the boys would come over to the house, and uh, I thought, well, I'm, you know, this is great. I've got lots of boys coming over here to see me. Well. Then I came to know that the reason the boys were really coming over was because there was a competition to see who could beat Stan playing ping pong. 
they'd all go down into the basement, and he was just this excellent ping pong player. So they were there to see the little guy, not to woo me. <laughs> and Stan and I had many laughs over our lives with this, this next little story. He, when I was a teenager, he um, used to listen into my phone calls. And as a teenager, you know, you can't stand to have anybody listening into your phone calls. Well, horror of horrors, he just upset me so much. So I hit him on the phone, one, hit him with the phone one day when he was listening in. <laughs> And the next morning, he woke up with a shiner. <laughs> oh, and it was awful. It was pink and purple, and he, he just, and I'd never seen a real black eye, so I just, I felt awful. And he said, okay, you have to make it up to me. And I, okay, so what can I do for you? So, oh, I'd bring his shoes out, and he'd have me tie his shoes for him. I, I, I'd get up from, and change the TV channels, you know, this was before the day of remote, you know. <laughs> bring him grapes, just anything I had to do, anything that he could dream up for about four days about how I could make it up to him for this black eye. And then one morning I got up a little bit early and what did I see? Stan in the bathroom with my eyeshadow. Swapping <laughs> up the... Yeah, oh, he got me good on that one. So we, 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 had, we laughed about that a lot over the years. But on a more serious note, I really cherish the time that I got to spend out here at the cabin with Stan because we had time to have long talks and uh, he could come over for dinner several times during the week. And most of all, I just want to thank all of you for being such good friends to Stan. You all meant so much to him. I don't think that you can really quite realize what you meant to him. He would talk to me about whenever he'd go to visit you and the good times he had playing pool and uh, when you had him to dinner and the things that your families were going through. So I know your hearts are aching too. And we're probably all wishing we could have done more for him during this last difficult year. You know, with the fire and everything. But take care of each other and remember Stan and the world needs more good men like him with his good heart. And now I'd like to give you, you know, all of the friends here a chance to speak. And Steve and Patty Davis, some of you may know them, uh, were unable to be here today, but Steve did a little a recording for us with some of his memories. And thank you so much for for being a part of Stan's life. Now I feel like you're all a part of mine, too. Thank you. Those of you folks don't know, but I was a good friend to Stan, and he was a good friend to me. Uh, he had many, many good attributes to his personality that um, I found uh, he was a sensitive man, and that he always remembered people's birthdays. Uh, and there were some funny parts to Stan, too. Uh, a hunting trip that I can remember where Stan ran out of bullets, and he had a wounded deer down in the brush, and he went after them and killed the deer with a knife. The only knife, the only thing he had. And uh, a friend of mine, Ron Mickelson, was with us. And he, we just laughed at the top of the ridge. We couldn't do anything else. It was so funny. Uh, my shot pool was Stan. Stan taught me a lot about playing pool. And uh, a lot of things in high school that I can remember. The parties and the cagers and whatnot. But Stan had a, a good side to him that he didn't show to all people. But he sure, he was always appreciative being invited to dinner. He was always appreciative for being up at Christmas or just watching a ball game, doing anything that needed, uh, that was fun to be done. And then, of course, uh, I went up and helped work on his cabin numerous times. We hunted together up there, beautiful cabin. Um, we had good times together. And some of, some of the funnier things, um, when Sam asked me 
one time, and I hadn't picked up a cue stick for many, many years, he asked me to fill in for a partner of his on his pool team. So I did, and I won all five of my games, and uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. I think I was trying to show off to Stan that I still knew how to play, but he was a lot better player than I was. My hope is, is that perhaps um, they'll have a tournament in Stan's name. Uh, I know they have one for Jimmy Dawson. Uh, maybe they'll have one for the, the, the Harry Shores tournament. I'd like to see it happen. He was a good player, a good nine ball player especially. Uh, and he, he knew a lot about just the right tap. <laughs> was needing glasses. That was another thing. He, he got glasses reversed. He had the bifocal on the top and the long range lens at the bottom. And he had them and it seemed to work. Stan was a good kid. He, even when he was young, um, in high school, and I remember so much about going over to where Mouse lived in the Woolly Apartments. And we had a ball, uh, and his mom made the best spare ribs of anybody I've ever had. And of course, that was a place to go eat, so we had plenty of fun. Anyway, um, as Stan progressed through high school, we picked up a lot of friends on both sides, and one of them was Les Mitchell. And between all of us, we did a lot of hunting together and a lot of remembering. And I'm so glad that we got a chance to do that because my good friend Les, who was the best man at my wedding, passed away. And Stan went to his funeral. He made the point of making the journey to Boise. Well, Stan, now you're making the journey. Good luck, buddy. Be seeing you soon. Hello, you beautiful people. I'm so grateful that Stan has had a beautiful life. Stan Shorsch was a real character. <laughs> Stan loved his bingo at Fort Hall. He was on a bad roll lately. Stan was a real character. He was like the odd couple, Felix Unger and Oscar Madison, who was the slob. <laughs> Stan would eat out of a pan. Stan was a clutter bug. And in his, next, in his house next to mine, he had never used the vacuum in the front room. <laughs> Stan's wife, Lori Shorsch, had many exotic cruises together. Stan liked my cat. His name is Bear Bear. And Stan called <laughs> him Bear Cat. He 
he was his homie. Choo Choo loved to go to Choo Choo loved to go in Stan's front yard and absorb the summer days. Stan and Lori loved to go to Rock and River in August. He stayed three days and it was like Woodstock. He loved it. <laughs> I have a surprise for you. <laughs> I was briefly married to Alice Cooper in 1974, but my mother wasn't having it. <laughs> Alice loved to get into my head, and he was like my psychiatrist. We were on the Sunset Strip in the 1970s. I also was a dancer on the Real, Real Dawn Still show, and, and I was also a Ghazari dancer. Stan and Lori have seen Alice Cooper three or four times. Stan and Derek Schorsch enjoyed golfing together. Stan was very athletic in his youth. Stan was also a great pool player. He had a rich life. Stan worked on the railroad. He had some wonderful friends. My magnificent, my magnificent of a full life for Stan Shorsh, who will now be in heaven. Choo Choo was his baby. Stan loved his cabin. And that's my epilogue. Thank you. started dating after we became friends. We started dating and we actually lived together for a short time and he was good to my kids. He was good to me and you know he always played pool and we played cards. He taught me how to play cribbage and he's very competitive and he never gave you a chance either. <laughs> he always wanted to win and there wasn't too many games that I was able to beat him at except for Pinochle and and occasionally some cribbage. And it was like he taught me how to play and then it was like, okay, you're on your own now. <laughs> and he had no mercy. He was very, very competitive. Um, Lori mentioned that he broke a lot of pool sticks and that was partly <laughs> because of his temper. And when he didn't make a shot, he'd get mad and he'd either bang it on the table or <laughs> and it would break or he'd throw it against the wall and it would break. and. So after we separated and we decided we would just be friends, I remember telling him that he was a poor sport and showing poor sportsmanship and I became his bigger, his other sister. <laughs> and for many, many years we, we just remained friends. As my kids grew older, he used to come over and babysit when I'd go to dinner somewhere with my husband or he'd bring us dinner up and we'd invite him to dinner and we spent a lot of time um, joking around. He was a real prankster and he got me on quite a few good things and you know from the time I met him we had shaving cream fights in the street. We did all kinds of fun things together that um, make me laugh still and he was he was very tight with his money. A real penny pincher. <laughs> and I remember we'd go to the store we'd have our list of things we needed and he'd always go find the bargain barrel where all the dented cans were. <laughs> and as I was helping Pam and, well, Derek, I call him Rick because that's how, I'm, how I've always known him, but as we were empty in Stan's apartment, I noticed all the dented cans. He still did that. 
<laughs> and I would never buy them because I always thought, you know, you could get poison from those, or those are the ones that get bad. So that's one of the things when we're cleaning out the apartment that I, I noticed certain little things and his little clutter messes on the table. He never used to be that. When I, when I was with him, he didn't do that. And then all of a sudden one day he just... You couldn't see for all the paper. He always had it out on the coffee table, and that was his file cabinet. <laughs> and Pam had actually mailed him a filing system. <laughs> I don't think he ever used it. It was still, the table was his filing system, and the, and the couch and the chairs, and it was everywhere. And <laughs> as he grew up, as my kids grew up, they still loved him and still went and bought, you know, visited him, especially Israel. Israel was what he called his tall son from as far back as I can remember. As soon as he outgrew the height of Stan, which wasn't too long. <laughs> One of the things I remember most was how proud he was of Pam and you. And he always, always wanted to be so, you know, he talked about you all the time. And I remember every time as, as Rick started getting older, we would go out, he would find cars, and he'd say, oh, I think Rick will like this car, I'm going to take it, let's go for a ride in this. And, and so he'd, we'd go out and we'd drive, get out on the interstate and broke a few speed laws just to make sure that it would do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was always fun to go driving with Stan. Um, when I first met Stan, the very first time I ever met him was through a friend, Karen. She lived across the street from him for many years. And the first thing he did is, I was there one morning helping Karen to do some something, canning or something, and Karen used to babysit for me, so I was there quite a bit. And uh, the first time I ever actually met him, he came in the house, and I was sitting at the table having coffee, and he came in and he said, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me last night. We, I was out, and in my car, his cougar, his famous cougar, <laughs> And it was a hot rod. So he went out and he was tooling around town way too fast. And he decided that his cougar could outrun the police. <laughs> so he took off and they had a, whole, a big chase right through town. And you're not going to believe this, but he took a wrong street and ran into a dead end and they had him. And believe it or not, he was, to his surprise, he was actually hauled to jail for the night. <laughs> That morning when he came over and was telling the story of how he'd outrun the cops for the longest time in town, and you know those darn cops, if it hadn't been for their radios, they'd have never caught me. <laughs> and that was Stan. He liked to drive, he liked to, he liked to do fun things. Um, but I looked at him and I said, holy cow, they should have threw, threw the key away on you and locked you up for good. And then I lectured him. <laughs> like a big sister would or a friend. I lectured him on how dangerous it was for him to do that in town, that there could have been kids out or anything could have happened. And, and he kind of thought about it and he scratched his head. And I don't think he'd ever had anybody kind of like me, just that he didn't really know, scold him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so as th we went through life. He was very competitive. We'd play pinochle with my family and things like that. But as we got older and... I, we were just friends, he would come over and he'd ask me about dating tips and I'd give him dating tips and tell him, you know, stay away from the, don't take your nice car, pick him up an old beater, let him like you for you, not what you got. <laughs> so I was kind of like one of his friends that we talked about everything. When I was going to college, my grant money hadn't come in yet and I needed to pay that day, so Stan lent me several thousand dollars to pay for my, my grants. And then when the scholarship came in, he, uh, I paid him back, but he was just like the best person ever. He, he was very good with his money, very tight. He never spent anything. He saved and saved. And, and one year he decided he was going to go, I think it was to Alaska or something, I don't remember. But while he was gone, I had the key to his house and I also had his checkbook. <laughs> I went in, I paid someone to go in and paint the entire house, put new curtains in, cleaned and cleaned, redid stuff, put new carpeting in, and he came home to a big surprise. <laughs> and he was really happy. He, 
he had an inkling of what I was going to do. That's why he let me have his checkbook. But <laughs> oh, that was fun, and I just will remember him always. As he got older, my son Israel and Gina had moved to Alaska, and he would take many trips to Alaska. And Israel knew what a poor sport he was about losing. And he knew how he was when Lori, he would get so mad at Lori for beating him that they quit playing as partners. So they, Gina and, and Lori would play, or Israel and Lori would play, and they would actually cheat Stan just to make him angry. They would purposely, intentionally put cards under the table and give them to Lori so Lori could beat him. <laughs> and, you know, they were pranksters. Claire, uh, he was always, Stan was always a prankster, and from the, from shortly after I met him, he was pranking me and doing something all the time. And one time I had a birthday, and this was, gosh, it was quite a few years after we just became friends, and he brought it to my house, and he hid it out in my backyard, and then he gave me a map, like a treasure map, and I had to go out in the yard and go to find all these clues, and every time I'd get to a clue, there was another clue, and eventually I got to this big, huge, plaster Paris brick-looking thing, <laughs> and in order to get in it, I had to bang it, and I went and got an axe, and I banged at it, and I was a hammer, and I chopped at it, and chopped at it, it probably took me an hour, I was ready to just give up and say, keep your gift. <laughs> And he laughed the whole time. He just thought he was hilarious. And and when I finally got it open, it was a, a little heart necklace in there. And and uh, so it was really fun. And and I'm just thankful that he was my friend. And he was so proud of you, too. He loved you, too, mu very much. And he was so proud of all your accomplishments. You're graduating. You're getting married. And you, he was so proud of... Every, he talked all the time about how proud he was of you guys, and I'm so proud of, of being part of your group and your family, and even if it was just for a short time. <laughs> and I really will miss him a lot. I really loved him as a, as a friend and a big brother. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Robert Lee, and I was a youthful friend with Stan Chorsch many, many years ago. And the last time I saw Stan was just a few months ago, um, over in Ridley's. And uh, that was the last time. It was not too long ago, and, I, and uh, he didn't look well. He always had a uh, brightness in us, because I see him pass over the years. He had a brightness, and we were always joking. And, uh, you know, I asked him how his family was doing, and he says, doing great proud of him, um, but there was something there. I didn't know it at the time, but I saw that because I knew him when I was like nine years old. We played Little League Baseball out at Ross Park, and Stan, Stan was a competitor, and I played for a team called Coca-Cola, and he played for Odd Fellows, and we started running around together, and there was Scott Sinet in the neighborhood, and he played for Idaho State Journal, we started running around together and doing mischievous things. But the competition was enormous back then, even as you're a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old and an 11-year-old. We would try to get the edge. We'd go up by Fraser Auditorium up there on the grass and we'd play wiffle ball every day. Wiffle ball is a plastic ball and, and you can get it to come down or you can get it to come up. And you gotta follow it. You have to have the physics of it, even though it looks simple. You gotta hit it square on in order to, uh, to be accurate with it. We would do that day after day, but he had to be the best at wiffle ball. <laughs> that was where he was. Wiffle ball, he had to be the best. If we'd go up to Reed Gym and play tennis, he had to be the best tennis player. So we were playing doubles uh, one time. We were just young, 10, 11, 12 years of age, playing tennis. And Stan was playing with the um, offsetting our team, and he was playing... Uh, and so what we ended up doing, the both of us got together and we said, now, we've got to make sure that we don't hit that ball to stand at any time. Make him angry. Make him so that he can't participate, so that he cannot par participate in this game. And then we're going to, okay? 
and he, he had this look on his face like you got to cheat to win right I mean that was where it was when you when he was playing cards you know later on and in our teens he, he liked loved to play cards but he had to win at cards and when you talk about playing pool um, it wasn't just in his later years uh, where he really took the advantage because he's very competitive there was a, a YMCA which was out on South Arthur it was just down from Pocatello High School and you could go in um, on a lunch hour and play at the YMCA and then there was a, a Freddy's Sports Shop and you could play pool at Freddy's Sports Shop well this was an advantage because the people that were trying to get good in those days would go down a tough guy bowling alley with a lot of the good pool players they had a limitation of time on when they could practice. Stan had to get the edge. And he did it. And he did it well. Um, you know, I remember when we were young, there was a, a, it was called the Dead Man's Cave out down at Ross Park. He says, we got to see the Dead Man's Cave. You know, the, the, the old days, they had the Dead Man's Curve. Well, we got to go see the Dead Man's Cave. So it was a rock and there was a little crevice in a hole and maybe somebody that the, the, the folklore was uh, somebody died in there and <laughs> he was squeezing through that and uh, I was laughing hilariously <laughs> and I says Dan, Stan are you dead yet he goes no I'm not dead and so after he went through I says was it a good experience he says no I says well I'm not going through <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> but he uh, he, he was always making up games. And um, he was, we played dodgeball around his mom and dad's house around on 4th Street and, um, and Carter. And, and the dodgeball is, is a very difficult thing within physics to be running and, hit, and throwing at somebody and actually hitting your target because your, your physics of your motion is running and you've got, it's like, it's the difference between shooting something that's standing still or shooting something that's moving. It, there's a different part of physics there. And he knew that. And we kind of knew that. But what Stan would do is say, okay, he set the rules and he'd get up in front. He'd say, okay, now let's go. We're run. Well, the dodgeball person that had, had the ball in the back was going to hit somebody other than Stan because you had two or three or four people, you know, and he was up there in front. And he's cackling. And he's going like this, yep, 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 you know, and I, and I after it, and we kidded him one time, I said, you know, you sound like Curly at Three Stooges, you know, yep, 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 you're laugh. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he just loved the competition, he loved winning. So you had to cheat in order to win. And so what I ended up doing, I was chasing him and knocked some people out and there was, he was, he was, there was only him and another person left and, and he knew he was going to keep that other person ahead. And so there was this milk carton that Stan's mom and dad had. It was out there by their porch. And, and so as he ran, ar as he ran around and, and he couldn't see what I did, I, I put it out toward the middle. And so we're going to do one more lap. Now he had the choice to either leap over that milk carton or else go out and around it. It broke his momentum. And he said, somebody cheated. <laughs> well, that's all right. But he was so fun. Uh, he was absolutely, you know, so fun uh, you know, to enjoy. And back in those days, didn't have a lot of money. Uh, none of us did. And so we would create things um, like a milkshake. And I'll never forget this, Stan's milkshakes. He had to come down to my house out on South 2nd and show me how to make a milkshake. And then we'd come up to his house and his mom would say, what are you doing? Well, we're making milkshakes. Well, you'd put ice cream and then you put a raw egg in there and then you put vanilla and you didn't have to put any sugar because the vanilla ice cream was a sugar oh it was so good I mean it was a homemade milkshake and it was so good but it was cheap as long as our folks had eggs and got a little bit of ice cream we had we didn't have to spend a lot of money because we didn't have a lot of money but those were the things you know that I remember so much you know about him he was he loved life he loved life and he was competitive competitive and I could tell you hundreds of stories and you wouldn't have enough you, you know you're gonna go to sleep but I'd tell you hundreds of stories of the stuff that we were doing and it's a good thing we didn't get caught <laughs>
wasn't really illegal, but uh, it was mischievous. But when I look back at it in the past, and uh, where he was, and how, you know, in a shooting pool, and playing dodgeball, playing wolf ball, competing with him in, in sports, and when he was on the Odd Fellows, we named him, we, says, we were kidding with him, we said, you know, you're probably one of the better Odd Fellows, aren't you? And he goes, yeah, probably. And I said, so you're the number one Odd Fellow, aren't you? <laughs> And, and he, he smirked and he laughed, you know, because, you know, he had that good sense of humor. But he'd get you back anyway, you know, because that's the way he was. He, he was a jokester and he'd get you back. And, and, uh, and but the one thing um, that followed me with him is I was in the Air Force and I was stationed over at Grand Forks Air Force Base. And I wanted to play fast pitch softball. And they had a city league there. And... Uh, uh, and there was a fellow that was here from Pocatello, Brent Heberlein, he was working over there for a place called American Tomato, or American Potato, and I ran into him. And, and Brent had a, a, a mitt, and I didn't have enough money to buy a mitt, so I, I borrowed a mitt from Brent, and I said, we, I want to get on the softball team. And it was a traveling softball team, and we'd go to Minneapolis or Cedar Rapids, Iowa, on the weekends. We had to do the tour of duty on the... And the fast pitch pitchers there... 46 feet, uh, some, many of them were at 100 miles an hour, and, um, and it was the physics of hitting that ball is, is not the ability, but it's the physics, and, and, and I got to thinking Stan Schorsch was what, what that helped teach me or guide me, and I didn't know that, with that woeful ball, uh, the way it would come up and the way it would come down and you'd have to look on the arch on, the, on that and, um, and even with the pool uh, he was always talking about the angle he was always talking about the angle of the degree of the pool and, and I played pool with, uh, with him and against him and he was very very good but he would always describe this in the technicality because he was a, so I put those two together within the pool and the wolf ball and in order to hit that ball, you had to see that ball coming off the tip of the fingers. And then you got the angle of where that was going to be in that zone and where they released it on the fingers. You knew where it was going to either to be coming down or coming up. And if you tried to follow the ball, it was going to be blown by you. You, you know, you're, you're dead in the water. And I was hitting the ball well, and this person came up from Minneapolis and he said, how did you learn how to hit that ball? And I said, this is a Stan Shores school of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and one last uh, in memorial to him, um, I'm on a life insurance trust with the Teamsters in Seattle and I work up there. And I have an administrative clerk, has a wonderful um, daughter, she was in high school years ago and she started playing softball. And so as I was up there working, I would spend some time with her and I would take her out to the uh, billiards table and I would play woeful ball with her. And I said, this is how you got to keep your eye on the ball and this is where you got to keep the angle of this. This was the Stan Shorsch school. Um, I did that for several years. I did, couldn't do it every, you know, just while I was working up there. Um, this young woman got a full ride scholarship in Texas to, for fast pitch softball and she just graduated. And so what I'm really saying is each one of us that are here can talk about or can experience the things that you experience with Stan. And my philosophy teacher in college said one day, he says, you know, when a teacher teaches you something or when you experience something and if you absorb it, when you go into the world, you can actually share that. You can actually experience it. And that person lives on. Even the ancient philosophers that taught the other ancient philosophers, the, they lived on in their minds. They lived on in their spirituality. Because they took, they took those values, they took those practices, they took that humor, they took the... everything else, the analysis, the, uh, the what-ifs, the uh, problem-solving, and that's what Stan was about. He, he lived life 
with each individual and gave you, if you stop and think, if going out of here, there's a hundreds of things that he gave you that you're going to carry with you the rest of your lives. You'll carry them. So he is going to live. He still lives. He still lives with you. And um, so, you know, I've always thought, you know, when, when you're born and you die and the birth date's important and the, the death date's important, yeah, it's that dash in between. It's those days in between on every day that what you do with your friends, with your family, with what you do in your community, how you serve people, um, what you can do in the kindness. And Stan was a person that had a choice. And I watched him even in his youth. He could, you could either be kind or cruel. He was kind. Could be, um, you could be a, do the wrong thing or the right thing. Most of the time he did the right thing. <laughs> but we all, you know, do wrong things. But he was, and he was sharing. Even though he, people talk about him being frugal, if he wanted, to, if he wanted to, he'd share with you. You know, and and um, but but I had to. But in sharing, you know, there was one thing that he would never share with. And leave you with this. About when he was 13, 14, we were at Ross Park doing our thing or practicing baseball. But he had to stop at this Ross Park drive-in and he got hooked on this taco spaghetti. Amen. I said, Stan, you're going to turn into a taco spaghetti, you know. And I think it was, you know, 30, 35 cents. It wasn't very much. And I said, could I have a bite of that? And I knew, the, I knew what the answer was going to be. No. That's my taco spaghetti. I never forgot that. He said, no. So I got off a plane. I was tired. And they don't have good coffee on a plane. And got into Pocatello. And I stopped at a place called Canby on Jefferson Street. And they have, they have pretty good lattes and cappuccinos. It's you can go to Starbucks. That's pretty good. It's pretty frugal, pretty cheap. And that's why Stan and I would go there, probably. But Stan was there at the uh, counter. This is just a year, two years ago. And I said, Stan, you're, you're frugal. You're buying this cheap cappuccino again. And I did the same thing. And he said, well, yeah. So I, I said, I want to talk to you for a minute. So he, <laughs> I knew he was ready to pay. So... I went back and I took my time getting my cappuccino, so I came up, and he ended up paying. And I said, gee, Stan, did you already pay for that? He goes, yeah. I said, if you would have waited, I would have bought it for you. <laughs> but that's where we had, you know, that's where we were. Uh, we had thousands of different things, um, you know, with Stan. And the one thing that I do know that um, where Stan is now, within that spirituality, he can look down and he said, I, it was a job well done. He can look down now and say, um, I did, you know, I loved, I, I learned, and I lived my life, and I accomplished a lot. And in the remembrance of that, I would suspect, and I don't know this for sure, but I think if you walk past that gate right now, He's either going to be at a billiards table or he's going to be in competition, maybe at playing bingo. Yeah. But wherever that is, you spot that out and he's going to be in the competition up there. And if they don't have that, if he's doing spiritual work, you know, and God says, I want you to do spiritual work. I want you to do this, 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 this. And if that's all there is, Stan's going to try to one-up all the rest of the spiritual people. He's going to try to say, I'm going to do a little better job than this one does, whatever. And if he doesn't, well, he'll be maneuvering. But anyway, I knew him well. He was always my friend. I didn't spend a lot of the time with him in the last, you know, couple, three decades. Always saw him, always coming and going. But you know the one thing, whenever I saw him, it was like it was yesterday. If you have a friend and if you have a true person that you truly love, you can, it, you can have a distance of 10 or 15 years, you run into them and guess what? It's a homecoming. And that's what it was with, with, with was a homecoming. And the last thing is, is, it was good, but there was one thing that I was glad to do for Stan. Um, I was 13 and my dad had died and I had a hole in my heart 
And, you know, people come to the Ferno and they're trying to be nice and they're trying to say the nice things and they're wonderful people, but that doesn't take away that, doesn't take away that hurt. And, um, and thereafter, a little bit thereafter, I was talking with Stan and we were playing a game of pool down at uh, Tough Guys. And he was talking about his dad, um, about leaving the house. And I said, well, you know, and it was really bothering him. And I said, uh, Stan, I said, you know, I know it is, but I says, I've been there. You know, even though I was only 13 at the time and I was young, some, I, I had the, not the luxury, but I had the hardship of understanding that. And I said, you can be whatever you can be. And if you have those stripes in that, you can either keep it on your shoulder or else you can take a path and you can, and you can still go and blossom. And I said, so it's going to be painful, but you are going to land on your feet. And so uh, a few years thereafter, um, he came to me and it was, now I think it was, I, I can't remember where, I think it was at the bowling alley. We, he was, liked the bowl, he liked to get in that scratch bowling. And, uh, you know, for money, you know, and he was a pretty good bowler. And we were doing a scratch bowling, you know, later on before we graduated from high school. It was that time we graduated from high school. And he said, uh, he said, thank you. He says, life is okay. And he says, you, you can have hardship and you can go on. And, and I will say to the people, the hardship of losing him is horrible. Um, you're going to miss him deeply. But as you continue to go on with your kids and your family and your friends and you bond together, Stan's going to see that. He's going to say, I did well. And he'll be watching. He'll be here. And I always say it wasn't what, what he was. It is what he is because I don't believe the was. I don't believe in the past. I believe that it is eternal. Amen. And he is here. You just don't physically see him. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? those kind words. Robert, Sherry, very nice. Lana, Pam, wonderful sister. And Lori. My dad wasn't a religious guy and that comes with some some pluses and some minuses in life. I think one of the minuses is that there's no set there's no set better there's no set schedule for what happens when someone dies. There's no book of passages that are tried and true verses that bring comfort to the afflicted. So we kind of have to make this up as, as we go. If you ask my dad about God, he would say, the, the real miracle is that we're here at all. Sometimes people would accuse him of, of, of dodging with that response or that it's a way of getting around the question, but I don't think that's the case. I think that, uh, I think that that's a, I think that's a fundamentally profound statement to make, and I think that it's right. So I'd like to talk for a bit about miracles, the way that my dad viewed them anyway, and and about the vastness and the complexity of the universe and how that, how that complexity makes us connected to each other and how that complexity makes us connected to the universe itself. I think he viewed the world this way because he was a natural scientist. He was a curious person. He would find a problem to solve and then he would doggedly pursue it single-mindedly 
until he had figured that thing out. Some of you may know of his eternal quest to corner the market on Campbell's chili beef soup. <laughs> <laughs> he had a nose for that stuff. He was, a, he was a fiddler. Didn't he always have a project that he would work on? I think he also viewed miracles that way because of his education. I went through a whole bunch of papers in the last, uh, last few days. <clears throat> and one of them that was very interesting is I found his college transcripts. <laughs> so you're about to learn perhaps some things that you didn't know about, about Stan. Uh, it's a little bit faded here, but his first semester, uh, fall of 69 over at ISU, Let's see, he took Essentials of Chemistry, and he took English Comp, and, and let's see, he got a B, and a B, and a B, and uh, he took a fourth class, he got an A. Uh, the A is in uh, uh, Fundamentals of Bowling. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, seems, that seems fair. But I want to talk to you a little bit about the universe. 13.8 billion years ago, time space exploded out of, a, out of something smaller than the grain of sand. That's a billion with a B. How do you conceptualize a billion? I, I, can, I can think in my mind, and I, I know what 10 is. I have fingers. And I know what a hundred is because that's, that's like the biggest bill I've ever felt. <laughs> and, but when you get into the million, and into the billions, how do you conceptualize that? Uh, one way, one way I've recently learned is that it's, it's, a, it's a number slightly larger than the number of keys that I inherited. <laughs> <laughs> but another way is to think of it in the context of time. How many of you have lived for a billion seconds? Some of you are like, I, I better damn well have. <laughs> How long is a billion seconds? You were told that there would be no math, correct? <laughs> I'm a billion seconds old. I'm 37. My dad made it to two billion seconds. Uh, two, yeah, two billion seconds. And my grandma made it damn near to three billion seconds. It takes you 31 years to live a billion seconds. And yet we use that word billion all the time, right? It's a big number. So, I, if you would have asked me a week ago today... How many more seconds do you have with your father? I would have said, I would have done the math, of course, briefly, and I would have thought, I would have said millions, millions of seconds. I would have thought a little bit harder, and I would have, I would have realized, and there's no, he's probably not going to make it to three billion seconds. If grandma couldn't do it, he's probably not going to make it either. But I would, have, I would have done the math in my head, and I would, have said, I would have said 200 or 300 million more seconds I have. That's what I would have said a week ago. I, I would have been wrong. So we live for billions of seconds, but every one of them is meaningful. So the universe that explodes in this thermonuclear flu uh, furnace and gases expand and then contract into stars and the light gases form into heavier elements and that continues for a few billion years about nine billion years and then 4.6 billion years ago uh, the the earth is formed it takes another billion years 
for single-celled life to arise, and then several billion more for, for multicellular life. That didn't happen until 600 million years ago. But once we hit that point, things really took off in a variety of directions. And only 150 million years ago, we had pterodactyls and cool shit like that. <laughs> Human life arose only a few hundred thousand years ago. And eventually we developed the capacity to, to transfer our knowledge across time and space. We wrote things down, we taught things to the younger generation, and we developed a method of testing ideas in a way that lets us, figure, lets us keep the good ideas and exclude the bad ideas. I'm talking about science. I think that science makes us connected because it allows us to communicate information across time and space. And it doesn't matter who you are, or what genitalia you have, or what your nationality is, it works the same for everyone. So I really like it that my dad took a whole load of science classes. That, that knowledge passed itself, passed itself down generation by generation, decade by decade, until the spring of 1970, when Stan Schorsch entered his second semester of college, and he took Intro to Biology, that was his first A, that seems fitting. Let's see, he took, he took uh, Essentials of Chemistry, he took something else, he took, uh, he also took Elementary Tennis and Badminton. <laughs> <laughs> so, how else are we connected? This is participatory, so. Breathe, breathe in for me, for one deep breath. All right, yeah. breathe in, all the way in, and hold it for a second. And now, you can breathe out. What was in your lungs when you just when everybody else was breathing. inhaled? What, is the, what does the atmosphere consist of? What is the most abundant element in the atmosphere? Thank goodness, not carbon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The atmosphere is 80%. Starts with an N. There you go, nitrogen. That's right. Second most abundant element? Oxygen, something like 19% oxygen. Here's the toughie. Third most abundant element. I will, I will give you $5. <laughs> if you can, I had to look this you up last you. night. No, I had, I had to Google it. I will, I will not lie to you. The third most abundant element is argon. Yeah, how, how long would it have taken you to, gotten to, to have come up with that one? The fourth most abundant element is carbon dioxide, and hopefully that one doesn't catch argon for, for third place anytime soon. So I had to Google that information. But you do you know who wouldn't have had to Google it? <laughs> Stan Schorsch, who, in the spring of 1970, took Earth Science. And that was one of four A's on his transcript that, that, <laughs> that semester. He took five classes that semester. Good for you, Dad. Full load. <laughs> How else are we connected? We're connected by our brains. Our brains are the most complex structure in the known universe. Uh, the basic building block of a, of a brain is called a neuron. It's a nerve cell that receives information on one end, whether it's a, something from the outside world or whether it's a neurotransmitter from a prior cell. And then it, it's got a body that an electrochemical charge goes running down and then that charge makes it to the end and it shoots out chemicals. How many of those basic building blocks of neurons do we have in our brain? Billions, indeed billions. There's a few estimates out there, but one of them is a is a hundred billion. A hundred billion. That's complexity. And each of those neurons can be connected to up to 10,000 other neurons. So if you do the math, that comes out to 
another number that I didn't have to Google, but I, I Googled just to check. It's one quadrillion. How much is a quadrillion? This is the number of, of neural connections in your brain. Right, so that would be a thousand trillion or a million millions, but those, those, those numbers don't make sense to us, right? So I did a little bit of math. If you have a one dollar bill, a one dollar bill weighs about a gram, there are 453 grams in a pound, there are 12,000 pounds in an elephant. So if you had a scale with one quadrillion dollar bills on one side, you would need 184,000 elephants on the opposite side to equal that weight. That is complex. And yet, even though all of us have a slightly different brain and that brain is shaped by, by different experiences throughout our lives, we, 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 we go through many things in similar ways. And I think I'm feeling that in the, in the room today. Regardless of background, we're shared, we, we share our similar nervous systems and ways of of, of analyzing and, and, and interpreting information and events. So our big brains make us more connected. What about water? I'm uh, already getting dry up here. <coughs> what is H2O? Yes, what is, what is 70%? Oh, I guess I gave it away. I shouldn't have said it like that. What is 70% of the human body made of? Water. And what is 70% of the Earth's surface covered with? Water. It's almost like we're literally connected to the Earth. So, in a bottle of water this size, there are more molecules of water than there are bottles of water in the entire Earth's water system. That's how complex this bottle of water is. And of course water passes through us and it re-enters the, the water system at some point. <coughs> what this means is you've shared water molecules with nearly everyone on Earth and with everyone from the past. I've shared water molecules with Muhammad Ali. I've shared water molecules with Sacagawea. I've shared water molecules with the pterodactyl. That's literally true. And that's amazing. So I think my dad, uh, I think he felt connected to the nature around him and to the universe as a whole. Not in like a not in like a namaste kind of way, but more of like a, a a humble appreciation for the 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 splendor of the world around us. I I think you could tell this through his life. As he worked his way through school, um he took a whole bunch of science classes. Uh and I'll tell you about one more coming up here. He, in a different life, after he graduated with his biology degree, he, he probably would have been a, a, a park ranger, or he would have studied cell metabolism, or he would have been an entomologist. It took him a while to finish the, 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 the last few credits, but the last class he ever took was general entomology. What is entomology? The study of bugs and stuff. <laughs> Right. But sometimes life gets in the way of plans, and after he graduated, he had a, he had a baby on the way, and so he, he worked at the railroad instead. And he would therefore have to commune with nature on his own time. And he did. Uh, as a young man, he would hike to the top of a mountain, and find some deer, and then pick out a big one, and then shoot that deer, and then drag it back to camp. 
And as an old man, he would ride his four-wheeler <laughs> to the top of a mountain and then find some deer and then pick one out that looked okay and then think real hard about the drag back to camp before he would, he would pull the trigger. Like, I guess that's wisdom. He would fish for steelhead, which is not a pastime that I understand at all. He wake up very early in the morning in November in Idaho. And you go out in a boat and the water rushes around you and if you're lucky you'll get one strike all day. But I think the the larger point is that it 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 got him outside and and that he yeah, that was his version of, of spirituality. So as a kid, we'd go camping, and he would teach me many things. He would, we'd talk about planets, and we'd talk about constellations. And he'd talk about the, the, the chemical changes that happen in a marshmallow as he toasted to a perfect golden brown. Uh, once... We, we were up at Toe Ponds, which was pretty much our favorite um, place to camp as a kid. And I got bored of fishing, because I was a kid and it was fishing. It's going to happen eventually. And, uh, and he saw it, and he, uh, he said, well, uh, you see that stone that's peeking out from the, from the, the water there in the middle of, the, of Toe Ponds Creek? Go over there and turn that over. I was like, okay, Dad, whatever. So I go over there, and I, tr- I, was, I was bored, but I figured this was better than nothing, so I went in into the middle of the river, well, creek, I guess I should say, and I turned over this rock, and underneath the rock are, is this huge variety of living things. Things with claws at their, at their fronts and their backs, things with legs, things with... And, and, and it, it was fascinating. I thought, wow, all around us, here I am, bored trying to catch a fish, and that there's the splendor of life in places that you would never think to look, perhaps, unless an older guide were there to show you the way. And it gets deeper than that. He said, he said, run your fingers across this, across the bottom of this stone. And I did this after all the creepy crawlies were washed away, of course. So I ran my hand across this stone. He said, what does that feel like? Does it feel like a rock? I'm like, well, yeah, but it's slimy. And he said, what is slime made of? And I was like 12. I mean, you don't... What kind of question is what is slime? That's like a four-year-old question that you don't actually answer as a parent, correct? But here's my dad leading the way. He says, what is slime made of? And I'm like, smaller bits of slime? (laughs) Obviously. What is slime made of? It's made of a proliferation of microorganisms that breed and grow and produce waste and have subsequent generations to the point where it's a tangible film. We call it biofilm on the bottom of this rock. So I'm feeling this rock and I realize it's not, it's not, it's not some abstract the thing that we call slime. It's a layer of living organisms that are too small for us to detect with our eyes, but we can detect it in other ways. So here's my dad teaching me about biofilm. It changes how I think about cleaning my sink. (laughs) I I can't tell you that much. So I turned over another rock. I'm like, I'm into rocks now. I'm turning, the, I'm turning these over. I turn over another rock, and it was an entirely different microbiome. Different creepy crawlies, different colors of slime. And one of them had uh, a number of, of fly larvae that were growing off the bottom of it. Eventually they hatch, and then they float upward to the surface, and they spread out their wings, and then they live for a day and a half or whatever. And my dad knew the Latin name of this particular... A uh, species of fly, and he told me I don't I don't remember that <coughs> particular one. Well, maybe that was from that that last entomology class that he took, and then he passed down that knowledge and that appreciation for the world around him that I that I think is is very valuable. So the next morning we woke up, we were striking camp, and uh, I look over and there's a raccoon, and 
And I'm like, oh, now there's a, there's a raccoon. And, he's, uh, and then I got, and I decided to be a wise ass. So I said, Dan. I decided to challenge him. You know what's the Latin name of a raccoon? And he did not hesitate a second. He didn't like, he didn't do this thing, you know, when you access information, you go like this with your... I said, what's the Latin name of a raccoon? And he said, Procyon Lotor. I remember that one. So, are we apart from nature? Or are we of it? Are we, are we different than the universe? What is the universe made of? What's the most abundant element in the universe? Small. Go ahead and tell me. Right, but what element, though? Like on the periodic table? It's, it comes first. Go ahead and tell me, Cameron. Thank you. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. <coughs> what is the most abundant element in the human body? <coughs> well, we just said the water. The, the, the human body is 70% water, so therefore hydrogen and oxygen are, be, are going to be pro- prolific, correct? Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the human body. What's the second most abundant element in the universe? It's second. Oxygen. Yeah. Well, in the universe, the second most abundant element is helium, uh, number two. But remember how it's on the opposite side of the periodic table over here in the noble gases? It's, it's inert. It doesn't interact with anything else. It's not really that useful. So for the context of this conversation, let's just strike that one. Curiosity killed the cat. What is it? So it's helium, but we're going to not talk about that one right now. Instead... After that one, the second most abundant element is oxygen. And in the human body, the second most abundant element? Oxygen. And in the universe, what is the third most abundant element? It's a very useful one. It's in the news a lot. It is carbon. Very useful. It has four bonds. You can do all kinds of things with it. Make proteins. Very useful for life. What's the third most... Evil minds that plot destruction Sorcerer of death's construction In the fields of bodies burning As the war machine keeps turning Death and hatred to mankind Poisoning their brainwashed minds Oh, Lord, yeah.
Thank you for coming out to celebrate the life of my father, uh, Stan Schorsch. Um, thank you to, to my friends who have, who have been helpful to me uh, over the last few days and for coming out. It's good to see some of you that I haven't seen in years, uh, friends and family, and I'm meeting some new people uh, for the first time uh, today as well. It's, it's like, I appreciate your, your love and support. I thought I'd, I'd run through the plan for uh, today's service. It's going to be a little bit unconventional, probably, but I think that's fitting because my father was a fairly unconventional man. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. So uh, we're going to have a few uh, members of the family who have a few words to say. And then I thought we would open it up to uh, anybody else who might have a, a story to tell or, a, or some thoughts to share. I'm sure those would be appreciated. And then I will close, uh, and then we'll have a, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, an, an outro. What's the opposite of an intro? We'll have an, we'll have an outro of my dad's favorite song. Uh, and then I would invite all of you to, uh, to come to uh, lunch with us at the at the Golden Corral. We've got a um, we've got a, a a private room there and you can just flash your flash your program and they'll let you right in. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something my dad would have approved of. <laughs> uh, Lori, would you like to begin? man. It was on my birthday of 87, not 69, that we met. Carl and Marty set us up on a blind date. Turned out we already knew each other and things moved. Dan was a hotshot pool player in town. And always at ladies night at, as Barbara and I at Garfield's every Wednesday night. He would always smoke us up. 